series, The Seven Wonders of the World. The first sermon in this series is The Seven Wonders of Heaven. And I know that most people want to go, and I want you to go. The second sermon today is The Seven Wonders of Hell. And as I said, don't touch that dial. You need to hear this. The third sermon is next Sunday, The Seven Wonders of Bible Prophecy. And I want you to hear how exactly accurate Bible prophecy is and how close we are to the coming of Jesus Christ. Today, the seven wonders of hell. I know most Americans believe in hell because I hear them telling each other how to get there so often. In the opera Faust, at a dramatic moment, the lead tenor falls through the trap door and symbolically goes to hell. On one performance, the trap door malfunctioned and the portly tenor singer hung in the trap door, his waist and shoulders above the stage, the rest dangling beneath. A drunk in the balcony, center section, stood up and started clapping his hysterically and said, yes, yes, thank God, hell's full and I can't go. <laughs> I wish that were true. Unfortunately, it's not true. Jesus records in Luke 16, 19 and following, read with me. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Father, let us hear this message, because it's your message and not mine. Let us hear about this place because it is a real place that every person without Jesus Christ will spend eternity. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it. And all of God's children said, praise the Lord. Praise you may be seated. A doctor and a preacher are alike in many respects. A doctor knows that his patient is desperately ill and he must operate immediately to save the patient's life. The operation is going to be gruesome. The physician does not want to do it, but he has no choice. The patient will die without the surgery required to save his life. The pastor is a spiritual doctor. He knows there's something desperately wrong with the human heart. God has already made the diagnosis. And without the surgery of truth applied to the human soul, the soul will die and spend eternity without God. There is very little preaching in the American pulpit about hell. If there was more Bible preaching about hell in the pulpit, there would be less hell in the streets of America. Jesus Christ said twice as much about hell as he did about heaven. Listen to the seven wonders of hell. The first wonder of hell is that anyone in this progressive decade would dare preach a sermon on the subject. Hell is out of date by today's thinking, but it's not out of business. Hell is heaven's junkyard. Hell is the eternal home of every person who rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will not go to hell because you got a bad start. You go to hell because you had a bad finish. In the theater of my mind, I see early on in the genesis of time, where Satan called every demon from the far corners of the universe to conspire in the chambers of hell how they might destroy humanity. And demon number one stands up in this great conclave and says, let's tell them that the word of God is no longer true. And Satan says, that's a great idea, but it's too late. Many already believe in the Bible. Satan number two, demon number two says, let's tell them there is no power in prayer. Satan says, that's too late. Many have already begun to pray, have experienced the miracle working power of prayer. That's too late. Demon number three says, let's get the pastors 
in every congregation to tell everyone in their congregation that everyone is a child of God. Let's tell the pastors to think positive. Let's tell them to tell their people that a loving God would never send anyone to a place this horrible. Let's tell them that anyone who would dare preach a sermon on this place is an absolute right-wing fundamentalist fanatic who simply doesn't have his act together. Satan said, that's the answer. Run with that message. And with that propaganda, hell has invaded the pulpits of the world and has presented a gospel that simply does not penetrate the lives of people. We are, in fact, a generation religious and lost. Look at the results in America because of the unbelief in the place called hell. We are swimming in a moral sewer. When a child disobeys its parents, knowing there will be no punishment, he will go the limit. If he knows that a paddle awaits his disobedience, he will behave himself. You know how I know that. If a man knows that he can rape and murder and steal without punishment, he does not hesitate, he goes the limit. But if he knows for certain that he's going to prison, that a death chamber awaits, and on the other side of the death chamber is an eternity without God in a place called hell, he wouldn't dare do it unless he's absolutely insane. Every murderer, every rapist, every thief, every liar who knew the horror of Luke 16 would never do those things. Right now in Sarajevo, the Serbs are murdering and raping in mass in something called ethnic cleansing. If they understood the message of God's word, if they understood the horror of the place called hell and eternity without God, they wouldn't touch a hair on those people's heads. America has forgotten the message of punishment for criminal behavior. But I assure you that's God's message. You are responsible for what you do. There is a payday someday. And if the courts of America have become too sick and too weak to punish the guilty, I assure you when you stand before God, you will give an account for every word, for every thought, and for every deed. The church in America has forgotten the idea of punishment for sin. The attitude has penetrated the pulpit and the pew. Just go ahead and do what you want to. The grace of God gives you a blank check to sin and do as you please. If a man believes he can live a life of sin without being punished, he will live a life of sin without limit. If he's absolutely certain that he will be caught and punished by God himself, he would not dare to do it. Jesus said, fear not those who can kill the body, but fear those who can kill both the body and put the soul in hell. Right now, a crime wave is sweeping America. A woman is raped every 48 seconds. Murders, drive-by shootings are so common that we don't even consider it news anymore. We're a nation of theft and child abuse, homosexuality and abortion, drugs, incest, pornography, witchcraft, Satanism is the fastest growing religion in America, adultery, fornication, all of these things are committed without the fear of facing Almighty God in the judgment. I assure you, if you understood what this Bible said, you wouldn't think about it, let alone do it. Every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl on planet Earth will answer to God for every word, every thought, and every deed that you do in this body. With the eyes that you're seeing me, you'll see God. With the ears that you're listening to me, you'll hear the Son of God read the deeds of your life. There will be no dream team to get you off. There will be no plea bargaining. There will be no insanity pleas. There will be no $200 an hour psychiatrist saying, this poor baby just didn't like to go to church. The Bible says you'll be without excuse. Why? Because of sermons like this. If you never hear another gospel sermon, you'll hear enough gospel a day to stand before the judgment bar of God guilty as charged. We are seeing a collapse in the traditional family in America. Why? Because there's no fear of God. 
The Bible says he that provides not for his own is worse than an infidel. America right now is filled with deadbeat dads who reproduce children and leave the wife and the children helpless and destitute to scramble for themselves. What is the result of the gospel? Well, out the place called hell. I'll tell you one of the results is the abandonment of soul winning in the church. The Great Commission has become a side issue in the American church. We are infatuated with what God can do for us. We don't want to hear about what God can do through us. The American church is, is obsessed with comfort and carnality and compromise. We have ritual without righteousness. We have hype without holiness. We have shout without substance. We have a feel-good theology that's produced what I call hot tub Christianity. Hot tub Christianity is soothing. It's sensuous. It's relaxing. It's laid back. It makes no demands. It dodges the tough issues. It never takes a stand for anything. It sees a nation racing toward the gates of hell and says nothing. The times are desperate. But the church in America is not. The Bible says, woe be unto those who are at ease in Zion. If you don't believe there is something to save, to be saved from, you won't win people to a living Savior. I want to say that again. If you don't believe there's something to be saved from, why try to win someone to a living Savior? I want you to hear this. If America does not have a spiritual revival, America will die, and the American dream is over, and a nightmare like you have never, ever thought about is going to explode. The second wonder of hell is the long list of distinguished people who believe that it's real. Jesus believed in hell. Often people say at the end of a sermon like this, tell us more about what Jesus said. I'm telling you what Jesus said. The tender, loving, compassionate Son of God said in Mark 9, 46, it is the place where the fire is never quenched and the worm dieth not. Jesus said again in John 3, 16, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Condemned to what? Certainly not heaven. Men are not condemned to heaven. Men are only condemned to the place called hell. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Say that with me, should not perish. You don't perish in heaven. You perish in the place called hell and hell alone. John, Jesus, Paul, Paul believed in the place called hell. He writes in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and they that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. John the Revelator believed in hell. He writes in Revelation 14 and 10, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb of God. Revelation 20 and 15 says, and whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If those men believed in hell, you dare not disbelieve it. When I was a young evangelist preaching through West Texas, one Sunday evening there was a man sitting in the middle aisle about halfway back that heard the gospel sermon. And in my youthful enthusiasm, I left the pulpit and went back and invited him to know Jesus Christ. He looked at me, a robust man of about 6'3", 250 pounds, and said, boy, I don't need God. The next afternoon, the pastor called me where I was staying. He said, I'm coming to get you. There's been an oil well industrial accident. The man that you went back to last night has had a load of pipe fall on him. He's virtually crushed. We raced to the hospital, walked in his room, and that big strapping man that yesterday said, I don't need God, was laying in his bed gripping his sheets. And everywhere he touched his sheets, he was literally tearing the sheets and he was screaming, Preacher, pray! I can feel the flames of hell! Pray! 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 and he died screaming his guts out. He believed in hell. 
He didn't go to theology school, but he believed in it. He said, preacher, I don't believe in hell. That's too bad. It's still there and you're still going. <laughs> You've sat in secular universities so long and been told that your opinions amount to something, you actually believe that. What you believe has no bearing in fact. Fire burns whether you believe it or not. The earth is round whether you believe it or not. Poison kills whether you believe it or not. Hell is an eternal reality whether you believe it or not and without Christ, you're going there. I didn't say that, God did. The third wonder of hell is that so many are going there. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13, enter into the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to hell, and many there be that find it. Straight is the way that leads not to heaven, and few there be that find it. The words, many and few. Hear it again, many and few. Jesus was saying the majority, the majority of humanity will spend eternity in hell. I know. Jesus was an extremist. He was a fanatic. He was a right-wing Bible fundamentalist but he was also God, and you're gonna face him someday. Is your life dominated by the herd instinct? Are you driven to go along with a majority report? Are you a people pleaser or a father pleaser? Are you more interested in being politically correct than spiritually right? Jesus said, your chances of living in hell forever are very good because you're walking with a many down the broad road. Have you duped yourself into believing that a loving God would never send anyone to hell? You're absolutely right. God has never sent one soul to the place called hell. You send yourself for rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are the guilty party and no one else. The Bible says the soul that's in us shall surely die. Open the text that I have read in your hearing and you see the story, the Bible story of a family reunion hell in hell. In this Bible parable, the rich man died and he went to hell. Lazarus died and he went to heaven. And in hell, the rich man asked Abraham, send someone back from the grave to testify to my brothers, lest they also come to this place of torment. I want you to understand that the people in hell believe in personal evangelism. Send someone back from the grave. I want them to see a miracle. God said no. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the pastor and the evangelist. And if they will not hear them, neither will they be persuaded, though they saw someone walk out of the city of the dead and tell them the gospel story. Nowhere in this biblical text do those five brothers ever, co ever come to confession of God. One by one, Sunday by Sunday, they stumble into the abyss of the damned. Will that be said of your family? Are you walking the broad way with the masses? Are you laughing at the reality of a real hell? Five seconds in the fire and you'll stop laughing, mister. You'll stop laughing. One day a smirking, arrogant man asked me, preacher, where does hell begin? I said, it begins the first breath on the other side of a godless life. One second beyond the last breath and you'll be in a horror that I don't have the ability to describe. It is there to receive the Hitlers and the Hamans. It is there to receive the murderers and the rapists and the child abusers and the pornographers and the adulterers and the fornicators and the lovers of the occult and those who are involved in Satanism. It is there to receive the fearful and the unbelieving. It is heaven's junkyard. And without Jesus Christ, it is your eternal home. The fourth wonder of hell is how easy it is to go there. You really don't have to do anything other than ignore the gospel message. Ignore the blood of Jesus Christ. Ignore the cross of Christ. Jesus in his teaching taught four ways, four ways to be lost. I want you to listen to this because many of you in this audience and millions of you watching and listening by radio are lost in one of these four ways. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost boy, and the lost elder brother, four ways to be lost. First consider the lost sheep. The sheep was not lost because of its plotting and its cunning to avoid the shepherd's leadership. Sheep are basically stupid. When you find out how stupid they are, it's offensive that the Bible calls us sheep. 
They are blind, they're defenseless. The only thing they can do as a wolf rips their throat out is to bleat. The sheep was lost because of its careless meandering. Say that with me, careless meandering. Until it fell in a deep ditch, its bleeding voice, the lunch bell for a lion. Are you lost from God because of your careless meandering and your foolish choices? The Bible says when Jesus saw people as sheep without a shepherd, he was moved with compassion. The Greek text says his bowels were wrenched with emotion. Why? Because Jesus said a sheep without a shepherd is already dead. His instruction to the church, there are 90 and nine safe in the fold and one is lost. Leave the 90 and nine and go search for the one that is lost. Search in the night, search in the storm, search in the cold, search when you feel like it, search when you don't feel like it. Don't come back without that sheep. The attitude of the average church member in America toward the lost is, preacher, I want you to pet and pamper me. I want you to forget about the lost sheep in this city and I want you to bless me, love me, pray for me, visit with me, pet me, pity me, whine with me. I haven't won a soul to Jesus in years. I haven't witnessed to the lost in months. I haven't prayed a prayer or missed a meal with prayer and fasting, but I want you to forget the lost sheep of this city and the lost sheep of America and I want you to pamper me while they stumble into hell. Wrong, that's not the commission of the church. Get up, you lazy wretch, off of your blessed assurance and be what God intended for you to be, a soul winner in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Don't you ever forget it. People without Christ go to an eternal hell. The lost coin, the lost coin was not lost in that it ceased to be silver. It still belonged to the master of the house. But the coin was lost in that it was out of circulation. And being out of circulation, it rendered no service. It was useless, like some of you. Some of you are saved, but as far as heaven is concerned, you're useless in the kingdom of God. You're simply out of circulation. You used to be a home minister. You used to sing in the choir. You used to be an usher. You used to have a prayer life. You used to do things for God, but not now. You're tired. You can rest when you die. <laughs> then there's the lost boy, the prodigal. It's obvious he's lost. He's a Jewish boy. He's feeding pigs. He shouldn't even be touching pigs, but he's feeding pigs and living with pigs. It's the lowest of the low. When Jesus told this story to a Jewish audience, their nostrils flared. They were horrified that a Jewish boy could find himself in such despicable circumstances. He had wasted his life, his fortune, and his good name. He got tired of his father's stuffy rules about living a responsible life. He wanted to do his own thing, but the more that he got what he wanted, the less he wanted what he got. And let me tell you something. That's the way it is with sin. The more you get what you want, the less you want what you get. This boy left home saying, give me. He came home saying, make me. And there's a world of difference in those two positions. He left home saying, daddy, oh. He came home saying, oh, daddy. <laughs> he left home saying, I want power, I want pleasure, I want profits. He came home stinking like a swine. He left home a son and he came back a slave. Are you in this audience or watching or listening? And you're in the far country. You're away from the Father. You're breaking all the rules of God. You're smiling on the outside, but you're crying on the inside. Your dreams have been shattered. You're living in shame. Your marriage is upside down. Your children are scattered like straw in the tornado. Life has no meaning. Life has no direction. I have a message from you from the Heavenly Father today. Get up out of that pig pen where you are. Kick the slime and the slink off of your body and begin to walk back to the Father's house. He's standing on the back porch with his arms extended saying, whosoever will, let them come and drink at the fountain of life. You are my son, my daughter, and I won't give you up. Give him praise and glory. <laughs> if 
Then there's the elder brother, the smug, self-righteous, bulldog, bitter, arrogant, e egotistical twit who stayed home and kept all the rules. For all of his religious rule keeping, he was as bitter as gall and as lovable as a bulldog with AIDS. He was not happy his lost brother was home. He was mad as a hornet because he thought he might not get all he had coming to him. The elder brother lives in every church in America, religious and lost, practicing Pharisees, finding fault with everybody they can in sight. They are the grace killers. They are saturated with condemnation and spread their toxic poison to anyone innocent enough to believe them. They are whited cisterns full of dead men's bones. They are trees without fruit. They are wells without water. They are clouds without rain. I ask you the question, if you didn't hold a position in the church, would you even be a Christian? Have you lost the passion of your commitment to Christ? Have you forgotten your first love? That's God's question to the church. Have you forgotten your first love? Your love to Jesus Christ should be like a fire burning in your bones. But most act like it's a burden. Feel like they should receive a medallion for coming to church twice a year. If you think that way, you better get yourself an asbestos suit, Bubba. You're going to need one. <laughs> Notice the condition of the lost. The Bible says, He that believeth hath life, and he that believeth not is dead already. Have you a son without Christ? He's dead. In the theater of your mind, put him in a casket right here in the front of this church, screw the lid down, and throw the key away. He's already dead. Have you a daughter without Christ? She's dead. Have you a father or a mother without Christ? They're dead. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not is dead already. If you saw your child in a burning house, would you yawn and say, I think I'll watch another television show? No. You'd scream for the neighbors to help you. You would run into a, a burning house, fight the fire with your head. You wouldn't care if someone thought you were a little emotional about getting your baby out of the house. They were there and you had to get them out. You really wouldn't care what people thought. You'd lose your life to save that baby. But don't you forget it. Every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl on planet Earth who dies without knowing Jesus Christ spends an eternity in a city of fire, where the fire is never quenched and the worm dieth not. Jesus said that, I did not. If I told you that a monstrous man was trying to drag your child or your family into an empty house and incinerate them, would you be moved? I hope so. I'm telling you there is a monster. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom Jesus said he has come to rob, to kill, and to destroy. He's after your son. He's after your daughter. He's after your mother, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your best friends. The Bible says, woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. When Zion travails, travail means has birth pains. Sons and daughters are born into the kingdom of God. And the problem with the American church is that we want a gospel that's bright, brotherly, and breezy. And don't tell me, preacher, that I have to change. I'm not telling you that, partner. God is. You're going to answer to him, not me. The fifth wonder of hell is that there's no escape. Men have escaped from Alcatraz. Men have escaped from Devil's Island. In World War II, there was a massive escape by the Allies who were incarcerated by the Nazis. It was so brilliant that it required hundreds of thousands of Nazis to trace these Allies down because of their will to escape. But no one has ever escaped from the place called hell. The only way you ever escape from there is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before you get there. There is no purgatory for those of you who think there's a second chance beyond death. Purgatory is a theological fabrication of the Middle Ages to dupe the illiterate. The sixth wonder of hell is that the prayer meetings are going to happen there. 
The rich man prayed in hell. He said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He was not asking for justice. He was asking for mercy. He received justice by going there. But like some of you, he simply waited too late to call upon the name of the Lord. It's difficult to get people to pray today. Announce a barbecue and you have to have armed guards to keep people from hurting themselves. <laughs> Announce a prayer meeting and you have to have a bloodhound to find them in the house of God. It's true. If you go to your grave without Christ, you will have heard your last sermon. You will have heard your last gospel song. You will have heard your last invitation to be saved today, but you won't hear your last prayer meeting. When you stumble into the abyss of hell, there's going to be the greatest prayer meeting you've ever heard in all of your life, and not one answer is going to come. Forever and forever, all that you're going to hear is the screams and the sobs and the suffering day after day, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, millennium after millennium, forever and forever and forever. This is eternity without God, and it's justice for those who splash through the blood of Calvary and reject the life of the only begotten Son of God. The seventh wonder of hell is its unspeakable horror. Here is what the Bible says about hell. It is called the lake of fire. It is called the place of outer darkness. It is a place where weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It is a place, where the tor it is a place of torment with fire. It is a place of everlasting destruction. It is a place without rest. It is a place where the fire is never quenched and the worm dieth not. I didn't say one of those things. God said all of those things. The rich man died and Lazarus died. That's the only commonality in this text. And you will die. How rich, how poor, how illiterate, how brilliant, how powerful, how, non, how much of a non-entity you may be, you are going to die. And on the other side of your last breath, you're going to face God. And if you die without God, Jesus opens the curtain of eternity and says, I want you to see your new home. He said the rich man died. And in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. He heard the blood-curdling screams of millions of people that never cease, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, year after year, forever and forever and forever. And there's no getting away from it, not ever. Hell is a place of consciousness. The rich man knew who he was. He knew where he was. The Bible says, and he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. He had absolute recognition of other people. This is no slow soul sleep. This is no blob of protoplasm living in eternity without recognition. The rich man looked from the bottomless pit of eternity, from a place of absolute darkness where he couldn't see his hand in front of his face into the city where the Lamb is the light. He looked from a waterless inferno toward the sparkling rivers of life that gushed from beneath the throne of God. He looked from a city whose inhabitants were moral monsters, Hitlers and Hamans and rapists and child abusers, to a city filled with happy, holy, laughing people dressed in white, standing around the throne of God. He heard the screams and the sobs of hell's tortured legions. And he heard the saints of God singing on the hills of glory. He looked from a city where the wicked can never be at rest to a city where there is nothing but perfect rest. He heard Satan as he stumbled into the abyss of the damned come to him and stand in front of him face to face and say, you fool, you absolute fool. You sat in church every Sunday. You sang the songs. You even took a pledge. But you never accepted Jesus. Welcome home. Hell is a place of torment. He was tormented, the Bible says, in this flame. If you have not received Jesus Christ as Savior, again, pull back the curtain of eternity and look at your new home. Listen to the sobs of the rich man as he's begging God. Sin, sin Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, for I am tormented in this flame, and cool my tongue. Yesterday, this multimillionaire could have purchased the sumptuous wines of earth by the gallon. Today, he asks for one drop of water off the end of another man's finger and can't get that. People in hell ask for so little, but they get absolutely nothing. Yesterday, he could do anything he wanted 
But now the tables of God's law have turned and he's in eternity without God. He looks at the millions of human torches, gnawing their tongues in pain, pulling their singed hair, screaming blood-curdling screams every minute, every hour, forever and forever. Without Christ, that's your new home. The Bible says hell is a place of memory. Abraham said, son, remember. Son, remember. The murderer will remember every person that he ever killed. The rapist will remember his screaming target. The homosexual will remember his sex partners. The liar will remember the, po the poison of his toxic tongue. The adulterer will remember his or her night of sin. The fearful and the unbelieving will remember every opportunity they had to, be, to receive Jesus Christ and they rejected it. They'll remember every song. You'll remember every point because you'll have a million times 10 million times a hundred trillion years to remember. This illustration and I close. A few years ago in New York City, a passenger bus collided with a gasoline truck. The gasoline truck tank ruptured. And gallons of gas gushed under the bus and the hot exhaust from the bus caught it on fire and instantly the whole bus was incinerated. There were some 30 people on the bus and they began to pound the windows with their fist, screaming, help us, save us, get us out of here. One man broke through the windows with his fist, cutting his hands all to pieces. The scene was so strong with an emotion that a man on the sidewalk had a heart attack. A woman who was there and saw it had a nervous breakdown later. It was filled with emotion, people screaming, save us, save us, help us. Mercifully, in a matter of minutes, it was over, and everyone on the bus was cremated. But in hell, it's never over. Never over. Forever and forever and forever. It's your home simply because you rejected Jesus Christ. What's your choice, heaven or hell? Who will you serve, Lord Jesus or Lord Satan? Where is your family going to have its final reunion? Around the throne of God or in the corridors of the lost simply because you rejected the love of the only begotten Son of God? I want you to choose now and recognize that your eternal soul hangs in the balance. Can we stand, bow our heads in the presence of the Lord? For certainly the angels of God are in this place. Holy Spirit of God, I ask you just now to fill this room in a very special way. How many of you are in this room say, Pastor, I am not ready to meet God in the judgment. There you are. By the dozens, people are raising their hand. Slip them up on the bottom floor. Let me see you. God bless you. In the balcony, raise your hand. Yes, dear ones, I see you. Dear lady, sir, young man, young lady, teenager, I see you. Raise your hand. Say, I'm making a decision for Jesus today. God bless you. As they sing, will you come? There's room at the cross this prayer with me, those of you that are watching by television and listening around the world, pray this prayer wherever you happen to be, in your living room, your bedroom, in the den, in a bar, you're driving in your car, pray this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. 
and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. From this day forward, I want to be your child and your servant. And I want you to be the Lord of my life. Lord Jesus, from this moment forward, I will serve you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and body. And now because of the blood of Jesus, write my name in the Lamb's book of life. And because of the blood, I'm forgiven. And because of the blood, I am saved. I'm a member of the family of God. And I'm on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name. Now just slip your hand up and thank the Lord for a new life, a new beginning. Just thank Him.